Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mind Pump. In the first half of this episode, we talk about how and when to train to failure, who should do it, who shouldn't do it, and how to do it. We talk about protein that is actually pulled from the air. This is protein you can make breads from. This is true manna from heaven, and it's real, as well as many other topics. In the second half of the show, we answer four questions from our Mind Pump Media Instagram account, questions such as, what are the advantages of using cable exercises compared to dumbbell exercises? Should women take time off lifting during their period? Is intermittent fasting the same as calorie restriction? And how does the central nervous system influence performance and recovery? All right, enjoy the show. Check this out. Training to failure can definitely have some benefits. You got to be smart about it. Here's one tip. If you're gonna do some sets to failure, make them high rep sets. One of the things that makes up failure training is low volume, right? The intensity is super high, so you're doing less sets. But low rep failure training doesn't seem to produce enough muscle stress to give you the results you're looking for. So if you're gonna train to failure, obviously the volume's low, but try to pick a weight where you fail at 12 to 15 reps, or maybe even as high as 20 reps, you'll find that you get better results that way. Now, is your opinion to do that more often than you would do heavy weight failure? Is that what you're, or always, or? It puts the risk factor down a bit, right? That's another one, yeah. So there's a few benefits to this. So there is this kind of cumulative stress that you get when you do multiple sets, right? This is why volume has been closely connected to muscle growth. Well, failure training is really low volume by nature. The idea is to do a set to failure, to muscular failure, so super high intensity, but then because it's so intense, you have to do less volume. And so that's like the selling point, right? And in, when it's novel, it does seem to produce some, some gains in a lot of people, especially if you're advanced. But the challenge is if you're doing a set to failure with like five reps, it's not enough muscular fatigue uh, to produce th the desired result. But if you do a, a set to failure at 15, now you're still getting some of that cumulative effect plus the intensity. And then what Justin said, I think is real important, going to failure at five reps, the risk is high for injury, right? Your form can go out the window, whatever. When it's a set to 15, um, you can really make sure that your form is perfect. And I would say that's probably the most important factor to consider when you train to failure is technique because I mean, your technique has to be perfect. Otherwise, it's a, it's a very risky form of training. I would say this is very, uh, you know, bodybuilder esque. That's totally very much. So I think their philosophy, in fact, almost to a fault, I'd say most of my bodybuilder friends rarely train to failure, especially in, uh, you know, singles, doubles, triples, yeah. or even five by five type. They rarely even run a five by five routine. And so the bodybuilding community tends to really, uh, lean hard into this tip. There's some truth there, right? Because if you look at like the strength athletes, like powerlifters who do train the low reps, they rarely train to failure. Uh, they, they they don't train to failure unless they're really testing out what their PR is or their max is. Um, but they rarely ever like max out as part of their training protocol. Now, bodybuilders obviously use failure much more often, but they do the higher reps. Yeah. They definitely do that. Now I've, you know, I, I've played with this quite a bit and it's a big difference. Like if I do a, a set to a failure to seven reps, it's not the same as 15 reps. It's almost like I get the CNS fatigue, but I don't get the muscle stimulating effects. Now, what's cool too is studies that compare higher reps to lower reps. If the sets are taken to failure, the higher reps build just as much or if not more muscle. So it's just one of those things like if you want to try utilizing failure training, by the way, there's more that goes to this because there's a lot of factors you want to consider and you want to be really smart. I think training to failure requires more precise programming than other methodologies because it's so high intense. But this is one thing to consider. Like if you're going to do it, keep the reps high and then you'll see more benefit than if you go, you know, really low. I don't know if you guys experimented with, with this yourselves. Well, yeah, I definitely think the fatigue factor is way different uh, when you go in the high reps versus like the low reps. So even so like you get that muscular fatigue, like the endurance fatigue, but when you, when you go to failure in the low rep range, uh, I mean, it's almost like your whole body shuts down. It's yeah. really hard to control at that point. So that's why I think that the uh, the risk factor is definitely higher in that direction. I think it really matters on who we're talking to. I feel like failure training is um, abused or overused in the fitness fanatic. It's underutilized in the casual. You know, yeah. yeah, the casual lifter, novice, someone who's just getting started in the gym. Um, they tend not to 
uh, train to failure or push themselves uh, as often and probably near, need to hear the advice that, hey, you got more. We could, we could probably put more in the bar or we could, you know, try harder or whatever. Uh, but with your clients or with your your people that are training, uh, you know, consistently for years and years, I mean, at least I fell in this trap. Yeah, they just uh, hit that button too often. Yeah, I, I mean, I I I used to train to almost every exercise I did and in, uh, in the gym uh, consistently, I would end up training at least one set, if not every set, to mm -hmm. failure. And yeah. I think that was a a, a big uh, mistake and probably stalled a lot of my progress had I not understood. A the lot other. of young lifters make that mistake. I mean, me included in that. And it's just like, you just want to test yourself constantly. And I do think that it's important to test yourself and in, in your abilities and your strength and your technique and kind of put it on display. But um, very less frequent than than most people would think yeah so. it, it well you burn out easily the volume required or not just required the volume of failure training to make it effective has got to be low so if i'm going to do normally 12 sets for a body part and i'm if i go to failure training i'm doing like two or three failure sets so, so it's like way less volume i'm going to use an mm -hmm. analogy i hope this works so if you guys if it, if it sucks you guys let me know but <laughs> you know what this reminds me of it's like a car performance and nitrous, right? Nitrous is a real fast, easy way to get like 20, 30 horsepower. Right, right. But you got to be- blow your engine too. Yeah, you, yeah. exactly. You have yeah. to be so precise with how you use it that if you use it wrong, you're done. Your engine's done. Failure training is can be super effective, but your programming has to be much more precise. You get, you get away with way less when you train to failure. So if you're going to use it, like you got to be really smart, really precise with it. Uh, otherwise, you, I, I you, think you that blow your engine. I think that analogy is really good because one of the problems with failure training is the temptation to want to do it because you definitely feel or see a difference, yeah. right? You do your first, you know, few times of failure training, and you're like, oh wow, the next time you get yeah. back to that exercise, I feel stronger. Or wow, I, you know, back when you used to measure your your success of your workout by your soreness, you'd be like, oh my god, I'm so sore. And so you become addicted to this, the, the speed that you get, you know, from the nitrous. And so I think it's a great analogy. And anybody who's ever been in a car or you use nitrous before, you got to be very careful on, on how much you use that because the, the engine isn't built yeah. to, to handle that much all the time. And so the temptation to want to use it all the time is there because you definitely feel a difference when you blast it. But uh, yeah, I think it's a great analogy. Yeah, or is the tires, the undercarriage, everything else supporting it. So it's like you want to go full blast. It affects the entire chain. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm glad I'm, I'm glad that analogy worked. I was, I was, I was thinking of a sports analogy. I said, I'm safer if I go with car performance. <laughs> hey, what's up, everyone? The, today's workout program giveaway maps strong. This is a strong man inspired workout program. Really heavy emphasis on the posterior chain. Get a strong back, strong glutes, strong hamstrings. It's a great program, a lot of fun. Here's how you can win it. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things. And if we declare you the winner, uh, we'll let you know in the comments section. Nowhere else. So only in the comments section will you know if you won Map Strong for free. Also, we created three workout bundles this month, each one of them giving you up to nine months of planned workouts. Nine months of workout video demos, sets, reps, exercises, everything. Here's what the three bundles are. Oh, and by the way, each one is uh, like $300 or more off. So it's a huge discount. Go check them out. The first one is the new to weightlifting bundle. The second one is the body transformation bundle. And the third one is the new year extreme intensity bundle. You can find out more or sign up just by clicking on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Have you guys ever used nitrous, by the way, for reels in a car? I've been in a car with a. I, oh. I haven't personally myself, I wanted to, but I've been in a car. Yeah. What, so I've never done it. Oh, so, no. So. It throws you It throws you back in your seat for sure. I mean, it feels like, and I don't, there's probably somebody who has the formula to this on uh, how much horsepower it injects, but it, it's like 100 horsepower, like instantaneously. So if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever been in a car, well, you have, your car has the ability to go from like regular to sport mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say it's for what you're driving and I'm driving. It's like double that feeling of that, oh, wow. that throw you back in your seat. You into the seat like crazy. Yeah. 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 Wow. Actually, no, I take that back. I was in the car. I had a buddy who had a Supra. Uh, remember the, remember the older Toyota Supras that people used to love uh -huh, to like, uh -huh. I, I, I do remember him hitting nitrous. But one time he took me 185 miles an hour on the freeway. He didn't hit nitrous, but that was the most terrifying uh, car ride I'd ever been in my entire life because I was a teenager 
And you know, when you're a, a teenage boy, you like the last thing on earth you'll ever do is tell your buddy you're scared. So I'm just sitting in the car while he's getting up to, you know, 150, 160, 170. And I'm like, knuckles, dude. Yeah. And I'm like, please, God, like, just slow down. You know, but I'm not saying anything. It was terrible. Dude, experience. speaking of cars, since you brought it up, have you guys seen the new, the 2023 um, uh, Ford GT? No. Doug, pull it up. This mm. thing is bad. By the way, everybody's probably what wondering. What do you like, their, their race car? No, it's their, I mean, you could, it's a, it's a street legal car. Uh, and you've seen the Ford GT before. Remember the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the what's the, um, the Ford, GT40, wasn't it? The, the Ford GT. Yeah, Ford GT is GT40. It is. All right, let's pull it up. I, I don't know if it is GT40. By, by the way, I want to, the reason why Justin's not here and he's on camera is uh, he's on house arrest. He, uh, he, he broke some law. No, that's not what happened. <laughs> he tried to. <laughs> Dude, start all these rumors, man. No, on his, yeah, show us your ankles. No, on his way here, he uh, the, the, he has to drive over the hill, and it's all shut down, right? Like the storm, we're going to get this crazy storm here in the Bay Area, here in California, and he sent us a picture. We'll post it on the YouTube. It's like a swimming pool on the freeway. <laughs> you can't come over here. Yeah. You're stuck. It was my last possible road to get through, and I'm like, I drove my truck specifically because I was like, maybe there's a puddle I can just blast through. And they just wouldn't let me go and try it. So I'm stuck here. That sucks. There it is yeah, right there, Doug. The roads are crazy. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's supposed to be up there in the Bugatti class now, bro. Wow. Yeah, it's like a million dollars. for. Oh, that they're going to charge a million for that? Yes, dude. Wow. Yeah, I was watching... Uh, What's that? What's that? What's that? Is it car and driver? I forget the two that's that's sexy. or top fuel. One of those ones on, on YouTube and watch them dragging against a Z06 Corvette and uh, about the same horsepower as the, uh, the Z06 Corvette, but then like half the weight. It's like way lighter. It looks bad though. Dude. Dude. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Re I've, I've like thought about this, right? And it's just because the way I grew up, I'm sure if, uh, if I grew up super wealthy, it would be different. But if I, I could have like a billion dollars, so a million dollar car to a billionaire is like nothing. That's like, like, you know, whatever. It's like chump change. But no matter what, I don't think I could ever own a car like that because I wouldn't be able to drive it or park it anywhere. Like Too one, nervous. oh my God, one chip, one ding, one like whatever. And I'd be like, ah, no, I mean, that's it. Okay. First of all, absolutely. You would, if you were a billionaire, you'd probably even consider it if you were a centimillionaire. So I think that you would have. Wait, I never heard that before. A centimillionaire? Yeah, like a hundred million. million? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, oh, so it's not like a centaur that's a millionaire? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you would because it's your exact point. When oh, yes. when people see stuff like that, sometimes they're like, oh my God, that's such a waste of money. This and that. I'll say, okay, well then do you think your your Toyota Prius is a waste of money? Because when you do the, the ratio of you make 150 grand a year and you drive a Prius, it's the same as a hundred millionaire driving something like that around, right? Yeah. So it's like he's yeah, just if you're, as if, financially responsible as you are. You well, know, a so. billion to a million, that'd be like making a hundred grand to a thousand right be like you're driving a thousand yeah, dollar car yeah that's it that's a that's why i said even if you weren't a billionaire i think if you're just a centimillionaire i think you would still do that you'd have it in a garage on saturdays we'd meet up and when you drive yours with mine and we'd go down the coast and then we'd drive right back you know so you just you'd run the just, coast for fun and then come back right just do those uh gumball runs right yeah yeah is yeah. that a real thing or is that just movies no, that's a real I don't thing. Know. No, that's a real thing. Oh, I don't know if like this the actual race. Is, yeah, there. I think there is. Look like they're, they're groups that get together and then they go, okay, we're going to go from here to here. Let's see who gets there first. I believe so. I how do know. we? How do we do that? I think we should do that. I I think we shouldn't. Let's focus on being a centimillionaire first. <laughs> yeah, let's, <laughs> let's one, not one step at a time. <laughs> let's not go to jail or die. Let's try not to do that. Oh, you pussies! The, hey, <laughs> hey. Oh, you're just gonna appeal to my ego, which is even worse. Uh, hey, how how is it for real though? Over at your place right now, is it like uh like is your house actually flooded right around there? Or is it down the road? Like how close is it? Is the flooding to you? Yeah, no, um, down the roadways, it is flooded, yes, but we're up above in, in mountains, so there's one store I have access to, and we got plenty of food and water and whatever, so if we got to bunker out here, we're going to be fine, but yeah, it's the, all the rivers that go through have, have elevated so high that they just like made their way through all these houses, and it's a real mess out there, dude. It's it's going to be a lot of cleanup for everybody around here. It sucks. Yeah, my my aunt her her like whole uh, fence came down, so she sent some pictures. I'm up against the foothill, so I'm up in the foothills, but then I'm against the foothill, so it's higher than I am. So I'm kind of somewhat nestled, which totally blunts the wind. So it's like super windy, but I think because where I'm located, the wind doesn't hit us that hard. Yeah. But then when mm -hmm. I go down the hill, 
I see like branches and so I'm like, holy Dude. cow, what happened? Well, Doug and I are down with the peasants, yeah. so we can get how, flooded. How thankful I am. I'm not in my old house. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Remember right. I sent you guys that picture of like basically one of these branches that was a widow maker just like skewered my uh, ceiling of the house. Like there's thankfully this house has no trees that are like in close proximity. So I'm well, like, your okay. old house was, I mean, you had like a, a, just a mudslide hill waiting to happen right there too. Yeah. You're, you're like in the worst scenario where you're down, like down almost in like in a little valley. That would have been horrible. Right. I bet oh, that yeah. place is all been, flooded right now. Totally effed. Yeah. You, so you time that no, I'm, I'm sitting pretty out here. I'm good. <laughs> That's great. I got Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, well, Adam's without internet for the next two weeks. Yeah, bro, that's weird. What? Yeah, because I'm Adam's I, back in the nineties. Katrina and I, Kat <laughs> Katrina, she's a savage man. So we had, uh, so this is so funny, right? We uh, we we got a quote to move the house, and it was just it was ridiculous, dude. I was like, that's so much. I'm like, I don't want to spend that much. I'm like, let's see how much we can do of this ourselves, and then if we we tap out, and even if I could just save half the money, I'll be happy. So we were going to, we were going to pay my brother-in-law to come down and basically like he used to like work for a moving company. So he's like really good with like, you know, the speed of him being able to wrap all the furniture and, and do it all professional. So that, so I was going to pay him a thousand dollars to basically prep the house. And then I was going to uh, help these, the guys that dropped the pod off to, to load it all up. Well, pod gets dropped off next day. Brother-in-law is supposed to come get a phone call. He threw his back out. So and this thing's already scheduled to be picked up already. So we basically have 48 hours to, to load this thing. And it's just Katrina and I. So we, and then I'm, I was catching a cold too. So I'm like, she, her and I both catching a cold and, and loading. That's good bonding time. <laughs> yeah. yeah so <laughs> it's amazing. Actually, she made that comment at one point. She's like, you know, I love you, honey. The fact that we, we, we powered through this and we didn't kill each other. She goes, I can't believe it. So. So we made it. We got over to the other place, uh, but no internet for two weeks. So that was weird. You know, it's one thing. It's one thing to not have like you know your streaming services, but to not have any sort of internet connection at all, it really uh, brought me back. You know, I'm saying like, God, what do we do when we didn't yeah. have that? It almost feels so. I mean, we were busy, right, doing the house, so I'm exhausted, and I had plenty of work to do. But even when we finally had that moment at night, we're like, okay, we're done. We're tapping out today. Let's take a break. We're both exhausted. You know, sit down on the couch and like watch a, a mindless show. And it's like, you can't do anything. It's like, so we <laughs> so, tell stories. Yeah. That's what it was like. We did, we did talk about like old high school stories. And stuff like that. <laughs> it's probably a blessing in disguise. Maybe. No, I mean, it's, I think it was, I think we both agreed that it's very uh, illuminating, right. To mm -hmm. see that, Wow, you know we're we're so used to being able to just kind of distract ourselves when we're exhausted and tired, and you know don't feel like talking, and then all of a sudden you do that, and it's like you don't have it. It's uh, interesting, you know. Oh uh, yeah, no, that's I'm glad you guys did, did that well. It's like the, when you have a lot of stress on you, because you know I've got a lot of stress going on right now with the babies and all that stuff, and it yeah. brings out the worst, man. So it's good that you guys you guys did okay, you know. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, I guys didn't kill each other. We had a moment like that in Scotland when I was driving um, manual stick shift, and it started snowing, and the roads got really bad. And I'm on the opposite side of the road, and it just was like we were at each other trying to like get directions and everything, and like get it right. And uh, we're like, if we were early in our marriage, like that'd have been a real problem, dude. <laughs> <laughs> we were like this close, dude, just absolutely losing it. You know, you got to remind yourself. That's so important to know. You have to remind because it's so hard to recognize when you're in it. Yeah. When you're in the shit, meaning like life stress, it's hard to realize that the reason why your spouse, your partner, yourself, whatever, your kids, that they're acting a particular way or maybe the way that you're perceiving them. <laughs> A lot of it has to do with just the overall stress because it will bring out, it makes the, the the bad of you worse and it makes the good of you not as great. So you're just dealing with the worst of each other and it's hard when you're in it because you think, oh, it's you know, hella hard. I don't care how long or how good you are, you're whatever. Like it's, it's always challenging to, to be able to remove yourself from the moment. You know, Katrina and I have this thing that we do that. Um, and I think I'm lucky. I'm blessed that I have a partner who was like hardcore into sports like I, I was. And so we have this ability to like look at each other and be like, listen, like who at one person normally can remove the other one and be like, we're on the same team. Yeah. We're yeah. trying to win the same fucking game. 
what you're doing right now, okay? Think about that. And you, right away, I can think of like playing on a playing in a game and thinking like that. Would, you'd be so pissed if like your teammate was talking down to you or not, yeah. or not you're just standing there with their hands on their hips. I'm not gonna do it. It's like yeah. you would you would flip a lid, right? You'd be like, get the fuck off the team, like yeah. no. And so getting the other partner just to agree, like, hey, this this whole thing, life, right? We're, we we've agreed we're doing it together, right? We're on the same team. Okay, well then, you tell me as a team player, are we are we playing as a team? And like. That kind of reframing for us always kind of helps pull it back in. Like you're right, we but are. Damn, in the moment, it's hard. Oh, oh it's hard. It always takes. There's never, never both people do it. There's always <laughs> like one person has the sense to be able to, to 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 say it to the other person, so we can kind of. And then because we have that in common, I feel like it re it relates really well for well, both of us. Like yeah. Well, right. I mean, you look at like divorce rates. Like they explode when people have a baby or lose a job or somebody dies, and it's it's because what the, is what is Sal along that note? What is the what causes divorce the, the highest on on things like that? Like I know we talked to Gottman and he talked about oh yeah the contempt causes. right yeah, yeah. but yeah. what ab what about things that happen to you like uh, like losing a job having a baby like yeah. what are well, the, you oh, know? so so things that are not direct insults on the relationship right because then we could say oh you know infidelity or abuse like like eliminating that kind of stuff believe it or not having uh, babies are one of the gr the highest threats for divorce because of the the challenge of it. First off, if you know if you don't have kids, it's hard to understand what it's like to have a relentless, you know, a human that's just you care about them so much, it's relentless. You, there's nothing you can do. You can't take a break. You got no sleep. You, you you know, your whole life is completely different. And then you're trying to do this with another person. You've never done it with this person before. So divorce rates go through the roof in the first, I think, two years of having a kid. Or it'll strengthen, right? Which or is interesting because, yeah, I was going to say, you would think that, you know, having this child together would would bond you more together. It tests you is what it does. Right. And the test can bond you or it could you, you can fold. Now, do you think some of that's skewed too, though? Because I've actually, this is a, a, a common thing that happens in relationships that are that are challenged. Many times couples will actually have a child thinking that that is going to bring them together. So what a terrible... I know. Yeah, I know. Of course. Of course. The strategy ever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as parents, we understand. That's, like that. you're, that's literally like you're on fire. It's like trying to pour gasoline on no, the No, it's, it's even worse. It's even worse. It's like you're on fire and then, someone, help. And then, <laughs> yeah, and then someone throws you a baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a great idea. I was already on fire and I have a baby too. No, but I mean, it's you, it's like you have to, uh, I think you have to when you get the opportunity. Because like I said, when you're in the moment, you can't. But when you're outside of it and you get a little break, you'd be like, okay. This is a season, you know, we're going to get time to, you know, spend time together. We're going to get time to get the rest and connect a little bit or whatever. So it can be hard, especially when kids are close in age. Like, you know, my Aurelius is, you know, he's, he turned two a couple months ago and there was that period. It takes like a year and a half or so, like a year ish where you're like, oh, you're getting out of the clouds. You're like, everything's going great. Boom, she gets pregnant again. <laughs> so you're like, oh, man. All right, here we go. Let's do this again. So it's a, yeah, it's a good time. Hey, I wanted to bring up, so in a recent episode, um, I talked about how obesity is not a disease, and I brought up this like documentary that was on TV about how medical professionals are trying to label it a disease. Well, mm. there was a, uh, a nurse practitioner who works with obesity in our forum who tried to make the argument that that it's good that they're going to try and label it a disease because her point essentially is that it'll motivate people to get in shape somehow. And I said, well, first off, people get heart attacks and decide still not to get in shape. So I don't think that's going to help at all. But uh, just to hammer home the point and really, really kind of just you know boil it down, obesity right now, if it doesn't have any other medically treatable factors, in other words, if you don't have diabetes, hypertension, um, or anything else. Let's just say you're obese. Obesity itself is not, unless it's extreme, is not covered by insurance. In other words, if you go to the doctors, you're 30 pounds overweight and everything else kind of looks okay, the insurance company is not going to cover a medication to solve your obesity because it has yet to be labeled as a disease. Now, the minute the medical establishment comes together and says, yes, it's a disease, the next step is for insurance companies to cover obesity disease quote unquote solving pharmaceuticals it's interesting so that's why that's the main that is 100 100 purely for pharmaceutical reasons yeah. yes it's interesting to me that somebody who works in this in the industry actually wouldn't see that i mean i feel like it's so obvious that it's it this is i know we always wrap things like this and this like we care 
no, we care. We were, we're trying to help others yeah. out, but there's, you know, nine times out of 10, it's, it's money motivated. And the fact that they can now prescribe drugs and insurance companies can cover it, there's going to be a fuck ton of money being made. By the way, isn't that like what's hitting trending in the news right now is all these, these obesity yep. fat loss type supplements yep. right now. So all that stuff is trending right now. These companies are popping well, up that if are, you're, if you're a pharma company, um, they did this with cholesterol lowering drugs. At one point, if your cholesterol was above, I think it was 220, then you could get prescribed a statin. And then they lowered the number to 200, your cholesterol at 200, which immediately added tens of millions of new potential customers. Okay. Because going from 220 to 200, like it opened up the market. If you could label something that a majority of Americans, yeah. quote unquote, have yeah. a disease. It is. It will literally become one of the most prof, if not the most profitable segment of the pharmaceutical industry. Now, I know what happens with people that work in medicine is there's a there's a lot of good people that work in medicine. I've trained a lot of people that work in medicine. They're very. They were all very good people, very mm -hmm. smart, hardworking, caring people. I'm not talking about that. What I'm saying is that the system itself is fueled by the pharmaceutical industry, which is the high. It's the it's the largest profit earning portion of the medical industry. And what they do is they set the narrative. And then when you work in that space, you work within the confines of this market that they've created. So it's hard to see. So if you're a nurse practitioner, like the person on our forum, they say, well, I, I help people. I'm really trying to solve this. I recommend strength training. Like this isn't a shot at you. She's conditioned yeah. to treat the symptoms. Right. Well, this you is, know, this is of, uh, yeah. Western medicine practices. That's like their thought process. And, and if there's a way to do that pharmaceutically, then they feel like maybe eventually this person's going to come around. But what we've found, uh, you know, from training people like this, and I'm sure you guys have as well, have had like surgery and have invasive kind of uh, ways of dealing with the obesity is it just rebounds. The behaviors don't change at all. Well, well, listen, this isn't, this is not a, a direct shot at the, you know, you know, nurse practitioner and stuff like that. I think that's why I think or the doctors, right? right or the doctors, like there's a tons of amazing people that are in it. It's not that at all. It's the machine, man. I mean, that's it's it. like somebody taking a shot at trainers and saying that like, oh, all trainers do is, is make money off of peddling supplements. Like, okay. Yeah. I don't disagree. Yeah, some of them do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a large part of, of how the industry, I mean, that I remember when we were talking about starting this, you know, years ago, and, you know, one of the easiest ways to make money or the formulas is to gain some sort of traction and attention, gain an audience, whether that through fame, magazines, whatever, podcasting, and then to create a supplement line and pedal supplements. It's yep. one of the, the fastest, easiest ways to build a legitimate business it's the product, in our space. It's the product in the market. And the yeah. product in the medical market is pharmaceuticals. That by far, by, it's, by the way, it's one of the most profitable markets, period, not just, yeah. uh, not, we're not just talking about, oh, this is what's profitable in medicine. Yeah, the it's, last couple of years. <laughs> yeah, so they, so they fund the research, they fund the studies, they fund the narrative. So you have to ask yourself, why label obesity a disease anyway? What's that going to do? Like, right. who, okay, whether we label it a disease or not, for the average person, how's that change anything? Here's how. Once it is officially a disease, now drugs that simply target obesity, not diabetes, not hypertension, not blood lipid issues, not blood st like strokes and clots and all the other issues that can become associated with obesity. Just being obese now is going to be covered by insurance, which opens the floodgates for companies. And what to do you what do you think? Do you think it's going to make it better or worse? No, it's going to make it worse because the the unintended consequence of that is removing the responsibility That's right. from the average person. It, it not, and not just I don't mean this in a, in a negative way. Like people are just lazy. But what'll happen is you're going to disempower them because they're going to view it as this thing that they have, like, I can't do anything about when in mm -hmm. fact, the only thing you can do about it uh, now and probably for the foreseeable future is change your lifestyle. And you're going to disempower people uh, through this process. So it's damaging across the board. Mm -hmm. It's totally a money grab and it's complete bullshit. You don't have to label a disease except to get insurance companies to be able to cover pharmaceuticals. That is coming and the pipeline, they're already preparing it. The narrative and the propaganda machine is going. So just remember, you know, we said it here. Do you think it'll be as big or bigger than the ADD market? Oh, bigger. Wow. Bigger, yeah. Way bigger, wow. dude. I anticipate it being bigger. Way bigger. Think about how that's many people. That's crazy. What, what is that right now? That's in the trillions now, it's right? It's huge. That's, it's huge. It's crazy. It's huge. But think about it this way. 
this here's what'll happen. I'm gonna make some predictions just so people think I'm not I'm I'm Nostradamus, but I'm not. It's very clear here. They're gonna label it a disease because right now they're starting to propaganda. So they're gonna label it a disease. Then they're gonna lower the threshold for what obesity is considered. So right, right now obesity is I don't remember what the BMI is. It's like over 22 or I don't remember what it was. First, they're going to start. It's a disease. Then they're going to lower the threshold, thus making the market even larger. Yeah, but okay, I'm going to challenge that. Uh, the The timeline of that is going to be there's going to be a good solid year plus between that because that's right. how you boost your numbers. Guaranteed. That's right. They're going to start get, out with yeah, it's a disease. Yeah, and then they're going to say, "Oh, obesity now is considered this." And then, oh, by the way, this is how we can increase profits by thirty percent next year. Is right. Because we're going to open it up for thirty percent right. more people. And then the yeah. way that they're going to sell it is they're going to say because obesity is strongly connected to you know, hypertension, blood clot, stroke, you know, dementia, whatever, everything, right? They're going to say, but this is good. This is a good thing. We are solving problems. And what will happen is within a decade, you'll probably see a majority of people uh, on obesity prescriptions covered by insurance companies. Yeah, yeah. So that's the game. That's the game that's happening right now. It is not to help people. Don't, don't fool yourself. It's not to help people. It's all about selling <laughs> More drugs. Anyway, <laughs> makes everybody crap out. Mention, uh, we have uh, we have two partners to mention today. Which one we got? Oh, you know what? Let's talk about Creatures of Habit. So uh, my oldest got his wisdom teeth pulled out, uh, which is hilarious because- <laughs> So he's like slurping food. Yeah, so he's got- So I'm like, dude, we got some- I got some oatmeal, bro. You can eat that. I'll help you out. So I'm making him, you know, protein shakes and I'm making him oatmeal and, and scrambled eggs and he's pretty much living off that right now. Did they put him out for that? I remember going out for that. He was, yeah, dude. They put him under general anesthesia for that. You believe yeah. that? Fun. I know. Yeah. What? I said fun. When you wake up, you're, yes. all, you're all loopy it's afterwards. <laughs> you don't remember you watch those videos of those kids that wake up from that <laughs> and then they mess with them. Dude, I saw one video where this woman was at the dentist and she was coming out and her boyfriend was there and she was talking about how, how sexy his friend was. <laughs> Oh, I saw that video. Did you watch yeah, that? yeah, I saw that video. Yeah, yeah, I saw that video. The dude's like, "What the fuck?" Yeah, yeah she kept going on and on and yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, that was. How bad. dare those people yeah, video yeah. that? You know, you know so yeah, but you know what's, uh, you know, what's so t I totally saw that video. It was cracking up, and I still made me laugh. But in like, how, what do you guys think? Uh, like, do you take it personal? No, 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 no. Yeah. What do you guys think as far as how many people because the the desire to want to go viral how many of these videos that we share and we see and go, Oh my God, look at this. Oh, I know where you're going. Do you think are like staged? And then how many of these do you think wow. really 90% are staged? Do you really think say. that high? Do you think it's that high? Yeah. Think, yeah. Because I, to wow. have everything, to have your phone on video on and be able to capture something that happens in a matter of seconds Damn near impossible. I am with Justin. Wow. I just read an article on reality TV. So remember reality was like all the rage? Yeah, yeah. And the article went through all these reality shows and it interviewed the people who are in the shows and they're all completely fake. Yeah. They're all completely staged. Like you'll have yes. an argument with someone and the producers will be like, hey, can you redo that again? But this time try to make this point and try and do that. Or hey, your parents are coming. So I want you to act irritated with this, whatever. All totally fake, totally staged. Yeah. So I agree with you, Justin. I bet you a lot of this the stuff that's caught. I mean, I, I tell you what, I wouldn't bet against you guys. That's yeah. for sure. I mean, I definitely think it's. I do think it's greater than fifty. I definitely think you have more than half of them. How? How? We, you know what's what's more weird is this. Okay, you, we all agree and we know that. Yet we still watch it, share it, and talk yeah. about it. We like to be fooled. Isn't it's that still funny? kind of believable? You know, you kind of want to believe it, I think. Yeah, yeah. it's just, that's, I, I mean, that's, I don't know. I find that a very interesting. Actually, to take it even a step further, if that is a real video and your girlfriend's talking about how hot your friend is, you don't want to air that shit on the internet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you're probably right, dude. Right. This shit's all fake. Totally. No, did you see yeah. it? Have you seen the, the, there's another viral one right now of the guy who call, he's, uh, he calls his buddy and uh, she's like leaning over his shoulder and she's got the engagement ring on. And he's like, he's like, guess what? Uh, Sherry is is no longer my girlfriend, and he's like, "Oh, good, you dumped that bitch." Like he's, <laughs> like, he's like, "No, no, she's not my girlfriend because she's my fiance now." <laughs> <laughs> His buddy's on the phone. <laughs> yeah. He's you not got, going to the wedding. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I can't help but go like, "Oh, come on, that's got to be probably." This reminds stage, me. You know? This reminds oh, me God, of that joke. Funny. I don't know if I've ever told this on a podcast. This this girl, this guy makes a bet with his girlfriend, and she goes, "I bet you, I can make you." Simultaneously super happy. Oh, I know. And super saying. mad at the same <laughs> yeah. time. This is that dick and he joke. goes, No way. 
And she goes, yeah, I can. You'll be super happy and super pissed off at the same time. He goes, all right, go for it. She goes, out of all your friends, you have the biggest dick. <laughs> <laughs> Doug over there nodding his head. Yes. It's not that oh. one. Not that one. It's a great joke, Doug. Uh, Come on. Hey, so yeah, I want to bring something. It's sound like 10,000 times, but I'm still funny. Gosh. I want to bring something up that's going to blow your guys' mind. Have you guys heard of, uh, let, me, let me see if I got the name here right. It's called, I think, Soline. Have you heard of Soline, this new company that's making food? Why have I heard of this? Okay. Uh -uh. Tell me, tell me. Okay. This is a concept developed by NASA. It's a, it's a source of protein. It's a food that they create. You ready for this? Made out of CO2, water, and electricity. And it's a, it has protein oh, in it? It's that's a food. It this is literally manna from the sky? Or okay. What? So okay. it's 50% protein, 5 to 10% fat, 20 to 25% carbs. 50% so protein 50 also? 50% protein. How? It reportedly looks and tastes like wheat flour. And essentially what they do is they take CO2, they combine it with water, nutrients, and vitamins. They use solar energy or whatever. That's fine. And then they, they use a fermentation process. So the yeah. yeast and bacteria. Nutrients, vitamins, like they, they skipped all that part. So it's not just like molecules. Like the, what are the uh, vitamins and, and minerals? Yeah, what's the macro? What's the macro breakdown? Well, I, it just it just yeah, says like here some kind of substance. Yeah, it just says here what the proteins, fats, and carbs what? are. But they call it protein out of thin air. So it's literally taking CO two out of the yeah. air, and they yeah. through a fermentation process, the yeast and bacteria turn it into a food. This company isn't related to the Soylent company, is it? I don't know. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. What? But how wild is this? Because not only does it get CO2 out of the air, but it's per, it's creating super cheap source of calories and energy. So okay. you want to talk about like a potential innovation that could be like groundbreaking. Is it is it is it just like me or does it feel like we've had some like crazy breakthroughs in like the last just year? Oh, yeah. If that. When you talk about been sitting on it, I feel you like talk about this, now, you talk about oh, fusion, you talk about open AI, like, dude, it's like crazy what the leap that we have made just this in this last year, it feels like. Yeah. A lot of this you know, stuff, all three of those. This, so I was watching a show that's like one of those like speculation things about ancient technology and all that stuff. Uh, and they were talking about the Ark of the Covenant and like you know, well, what if it was like actually a machine? And like one guy actually speculated that it was a machine like this that could literally create um, manna, uh, you know, from, from thin air, basically convert it from CO2 and all that. And they actually described the whole thing just like you're saying. Oh, oh weird. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Yeah, so Doug brought up the website and it basically it's, it's used like flour. So you can make foods, breads, whatever, because it's like flour, I'm assuming the shelf life on this is probably phenomenal. So I'm also assuming you have to pair it with other things in too, right? Like yeah, you turn you can turn it into things. That's what it's showing. Beverages, snacks, breads. But because it's it's got, it probably has a really long shelf life. It's probably really cheap to produce uh, and it takes CO2 out of the air. Now, whether it's healthy or not, because I don't know what this is, I don't know how it affects the body. Well, for somebody it's who's dying of starvation, it's amazing. Well, for yes, that that too. But besides all of that, this could be one of the most disruptive things to the food market yeah. that I could possibly think of. This could be crazy. Uh, food market, like energy market, and internet. Like the, like literally the like three huge markets are being disrupted in this last year. It's so wild. Dude, what? We need to do a whole podcast where we have like an inventory of all of these new breakthroughs that are coming out just to, to keep tabs, you know? Like, so what else? I mean, we have like the open AI stuff. We have like all of that happening simultaneously. There's you know, other breakthroughs like medically that they've figured out. Like, who knows? Can we grow limbs now? Is that a thing? Well, no, but we can make ourselves two to four inches taller. Oh, I know. <laughs> well, so far, that's a, that's a messed there, up that surgery. Yeah. There's a lot of people doing it. I can't believe that. That's it's. Do you know it, what they do? Yes. They like, they basically break your femur and they then cut add it. it. They yeah. cut it and then they, they separate the two pieces and connect metal rods and allow the bones to grow together. So little by little, you go in. And they separate it a little, like a few centimeters at a time. They keep stretching it out, keep stretching out, allowing the bone to kind of start to grow. Together. Oh, I thought they actually cut fusion, it and then in, you know, in like the, we almost have fusion. <laughs> yeah, like uh, yeah. No, it's no, getting, no. Maybe Doug can look it up. 
they literally they'll take your bone, separate it just a little bit, and then you go in and there's a they go there's a they crank it and they slowly what? stretch. I out. thought they cut it and then insert like a no. you know like a two inch pump and then you're then you got yourself. No, the bone actually grows that way. So they actually what? make your your femur. Now the only funny thing about this is you get two inches or three inches taller, but it's all your femur. So it's like you just got long, <laughs> longer get those top legs. legs. Well, I mean, there's yeah. there's people that have like longer legs and torsos, right? <laughs> I know, I and I, I don't know, is one or two inches <laughs> enough to make Stilts. it look really oddly? Yeah. It would be weird if it looked really odd. Maybe on like, yeah, I guess you're right. Like it, a two inch lift isn't a big deal. No. You know what I'm saying? But what does like, it say there, Doug? Was it Kevin Durant that has those really long skinny legs? Well, <laughs> athletes yeah, tend yeah. to running running. You know, people who run a lot. Doug. So they add a magnetic lengthening rod and pins into the bone, which allows the leg to be controlled have controlled lengthening over a period of time. Yeah, so you go wow. in and they crank it, crank it, crank oh, it. Oh, that's not what I thought. Whoa. It's fucked up. That's way fucked up. It's like a torture. Is what yeah, it, it does. <laughs> oh, my God. So if I come in one day and I'm looking a little taller, then you'll know. I can't imagine what that feels wow, like. Wow, look at the before and after. Yeah, that's yeah. That's, that's a big difference. Yeah, it's a huge difference. How much taller is he? It's right a there? huge difference right there. Oh my three God. inches. It's a three inch. Three it's inches. a three. Yeah, three inch wow. game. Wow, dude, that looks so crazy. Now, you, you, if you, did you have braces or no? No. Oh, uh, Doug, did you have braces? Uh, yeah, I had Invisalign. Yeah. I mean, oh, so well, you know, when you get your new your new retainer with that, how much your fucking teeth hurt the whole day? Like, imagine your femur. <laughs> oh, <laughs> ache. Yeah, that's, that's weird. Well, you know, I mean, I'm, there's a market for it. It's wild. Dude. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's super. So who's our our next uh, mention today? Is it Caldera, Doug? Are we talking yeah, about yeah, Caldera? Yeah, it is again? Caldera, yeah. Yes. You know, you know that they are, from the social media that I see, seem to be completely exploding. Yeah. Like everywhere. Yeah. This is a product that I admittedly, I'm going to be honest, <laughs> didn't, not because I hadn't used it I had, or because I used it, I hadn't used it, but we got approached by them. I'm like, skincare? Well, whatever. You know, what's, what's going to happen with this? Expl I mean, they obviously sold Do us. Do you think that's part of why, though, is, you know, like when you go watch a movie that you heard was not good, yeah. and then you watch it and it ends up being good, or you have expectations it's not going to be good, and then yeah. you go and you watch it, and then it's great. Do you think that's part of why, one, you like it, and a lot of people, like especially in the men, in the- in I the, think that's the men. Yeah, because yeah. men, because like- I, I, I'm, No expectations, and it way exceeded it. That's you know? how I feel. I feel like, nah, you're not going to give me some- cr I, I, Honestly, like up until Caldera- I've never been somebody who's I'm I'm the the guy who does the you know bar of soap and then he washes his face like that you know what I'm saying yeah. this is how I've always soap. yeah dude, yeah <laughs> literally dude that shit like that you know what I'm saying like whatever and thinking like oh I'm gonna buy some oil or cream that you know makes this huge difference I always thought it was just a hardcore but it's one of those things that you will instantly see the difference and I yeah. think that's what gets you is that it's like uh. Eh, let me see if I notice a difference and you put it, you put it on, you rub it in, you go like, okay, shit, I do see no, it. No, I don't know how much they've grown since the, over the last couple of years, but it's got to be massive because I see them all oh, over the place now. But I, my favorite thing is, is now Adam's like uh, commercial comes up all the time. <laughs> and then also like Mario Lopez follows it right after. <laughs> <laughs> that Adam's guy looks, that guy, man, I swear, he's got to be 50-something, right? No, he's not 50 yet, is he? Mario Lopez? Is he? He's, he's at least man. 10 years older than we are. Is he in his 50s? Bro, Saved by the Bell, we were kids, right? He's when 49. Saved... Yeah, see? Wow. He's almost 50. Yeah. He looks like a baby. He does look young. His, yeah. his skin does look amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, shout shout out to Mario so great. <laughs> What's wrong with us right now? <laughs> were you, you were, are you a fan of him? Or are you like, he's got so many like TV shows. He's nah, kind of cringy to me. I never liked him, bro. Yeah. I was not I've never met him, so I can't I was not a Slater shit, fan on uh, Saved by the Bell. I, I liked, uh, what's his name? What's the other character's name? I liked him better when he had a curly mullet. Yeah. Uh, do you remember? Hey, do you remember in Saved by the Bell? So what's Zach? I like Zach. Remember in Saved by the Bell? Every once in a while, Slater would bust out and dance, but he didn't like dance like cool kids dance. He danced like like he did like a uh, like modern dance or ballet or something like that. Remember that? <laughs> He'd like do kicks and stuff. He'd always like, be in that like that wrestling onesie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come on, guy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. What are you doing, bro? Hey, did you guys? Are you guys seeing what's uh, what ha what Larry Wheels has been up to? I, I saw his post where he his fat his face looked all fat and he said it looks like estrogens up a little bit. Okay, <laughs> so Larry Wheels is uh, I mean he's like a you know whatever he's a strength athlete on social media like incredibly strong like insanely strong freakish individual. strength freakish strength that as young as a young at a young age he was in his twenties or whatever anyway he went off um, bodybuilder doses of anabolic steroids 
and went on pure TRT. And he's literally, he's like labeling exactly what he's doing. So he's like, I'm only on hormone replacement because I've taken steroids since I was 17. Now I need hormone replacement, but I'm off all anabolic steroids. I'm off high doses of testosterone. I think he's using like 170 milligrams a week of testosterone to replace, which is a reasonable, normal yeah. dose of testosterone. And what he's doing is he's documenting the changes in his body and his strength levels. So he just did a mock powerlifting event. I'm going to pull it up for you. And this is over the course of, I want to say he's been off everything for a year and only been on TRT for a year. I, I want to say, I think that's-, that's Has it been already a year? Because I remember when he did the, the before and after of him you know, switching over. Yeah, I think it's been almost a year. If I want to say, but anyway, here's the numbers for his powerlifting. Okay, yeah, yeah. He did a he did a squat. His squat went down five point eight percent from his previous record. So it went from seven seventy one seven hundred seventy one pounds to seven hundred twenty seven pounds. So not, only on not, TRT, not bad at all. No, his bench press went from five hundred seventy three pounds to five hundred seven pounds. So that's a uh, that's a twelve percent yeah. uh, drop. His deadlift went down uh, by fifty four uh, by fifty four pounds, so six point eight percent. So his, his deadlift came in at seven hundred seventy one pounds, which was fifty okay. pounds lighter than normal. So this is what he's saying, or this is what he's reporting. By the way, if you look at his his face and his his body, you could definitely tell he's not on the same stuff anymore. But what do you think about that? Do you think a year no, is enough not. time? No, no, definitely not. Yeah, that's what definitely, I was definitely not. I mean, you're especially the uh, the amounts that he was taking and how long he'd been training. Yeah, yeah. I remember feeling the residuals of my my stack after bodybuilding for at, feeling it six months later. Probably yeah. still there for almost a year. So uh, it, I will be. I'd be more interested to see. I hope like he's, five years from now. Oh, even a, another year, like just yeah. so we could see uh, is it continue on that percentage, right? So if he lost five percent, five point eight percent this year, and then he loses another five point eight percent, like if he keeps staying on that trajectory, then you could probably guesstimate that. Oh, maybe in five years he's back to like more of a reality. But I also, I mean, you've you've um, you've referenced studies before though that talk about you know once you do it, you you have some. You you keep some for life, yeah. right? I mean, I definitely know that uh, every time that I had used anabolics, like it it leveled me up as far as a size and, and and strength level. That even though I came back down coming off, I still was higher than what what my previous natural. I used to think that if you went on uh, anabolics and then you went off, that your body would just go back to what its capabilities were when you were off them. But I don't, I don't agree with that anymore because I know how powerful muscle memory is. Yeah. So if you build 10 pounds of muscle and it takes you a year to do so, and then you lose it all, you'll gain it back within a month. That's how fast, that's how powerful muscle memory is. So if you gain 30 pounds of muscle by taking anabolic steroids for three years or whatever, and it's solid muscle, and then you go off and you lose some, you still have that muscle memory that's left over from before. Yeah, so you're at an advantage. The technique, your CNS, your body's ability just to- Your receptors, yeah, you increase your, those. Your bones. I mean, your 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 body is now adapted yeah. to, at least that's how I felt from it, right? I felt like, you know, that took me to this whole new level, my body, and then I was there long enough that my body got adapted to that. So even though I'm off and I'm, I'm nowhere near quite as strong as I was when I was on my big stacks, but I'm still way stronger than I was at my or, strongest. In, or uh, stronger natural. than you would have gotten. Right. Had you not done anything. Right, like right, that. right, right. I know. And that's it. I, it's a controversial thing to say because <clears throat> there may be some kid listening right now that's like, oh, well, then it's worth it. It's worth it to do, you know, all these anabolics because I'll keep some of it or whatever. Um, to which I say, you are definitely risking uh, having to take, you know, hormones for the rest of your life. So, but I mean, I don't know if that'll convince anybody. Wouldn't it convince me? Yeah, it too. wouldn't have convinced me either, but I still would, I would still say that because there are some people that I think are on the fence. And if you told them like, listen, if you, you go down this path, there's a very, there very high potential. You may be doing it for the rest of your life. So take that into consideration. Yeah. I do think there's enough, enough people that hopefully that message goes like, oh, yeah, I kind of want to try it, yeah. but uh, not at the not at the rate of or the potential of me having to take this stuff forever. Yeah. I don't think I want to be. Yeah. Speaking of 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 which, uh, you know, mphormones.com, I I I went on this new um, protocol where they're they've introduced these kind of cognitive boosting compounds and peptides. Oh yeah, do you know the names of all of them? Yeah, I'm so supposed to get mine soon, so I'm curious how it's working for did you. Did you do the same stack? He did. 
Yeah. Oh, look at you guys. That same peptide stack. Yeah, we're going to check it out and compare and contrast. So, by the way, this is part of a larger thing. And it's th so don't go out and do this on your own. I'm working with doctors and they're monitoring things because these are really act these are active compounds. It's not like I'm taking vitamins and you know a you know, mushroom supplement or whatever. So uh, you got to make sure you're monitored or whatever. But anyway, um, one of them is Dihexa. The other one's called C Max, and it's now almost a week, and it's pretty wild. It's actually pretty remarkably wild. I am <coughs> sleep deprived. We ha we have an infant at home. We got a toddler. Uh, you know, it's, it's just been very stressful at home. You've had family members die. You've got just, all kinds of stuff going yeah, on. I just, the, my, yeah, just a lot of stressful things a lot of people don't know about, but a lot of stuff going on. <clears throat> For all intents and purposes, I literally should be, uh, I should feel exactly. way worse than I do. Way yeah. worse. And yet I feel sharp. So it's really strange. It's re But this is one weekend. So, so you know what would be interesting to me is that I wonder if, like in your state is where you feel something like that the most, right? Oh, good, like if good you, point. Like if you, because like if such, I was optimized, right? You're already a healthy, optimized person, yeah. right? And so if you took something like this and you're pretty well balanced and you you're you are a very healthy person, would I even notice? Would you notice very much, or maybe it's really moderate? But because you're under all that and you know how you should feel, and because you're taking that, I would venture to say that it's kind of like uh, taking testosterone supplements, right? Like if you're already optimized and you take some testosterone supplements, it's not going to do shit for your testosterone. Right. But if it's in the floor and you take some of these testosterone game supplements, you'd say, yeah, it's a game wow, changer. Wow, what a good point. Yeah. yeah, the doctors actually told me that is like um, a lot of people like expect some kind of stimulus kind of uh, response or something like you feel right away from it, but that's not the case. Like it's, it's one of those that uh, sort of increases cognition, all that happens over time. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm noticing that uh, I feel uh, sh it's not stimulatory, so it doesn't feel like a stimulant. It just feels calm and uh, like memory recall and word recall is easier. So like mm -hmm. words come to me faster yeah, and yeah. I feel, I just feel smoother, but that's a great point, Adam. We'll see how it feels when things level out. I mean, me. either way, that's cool because- let's say that that is the reason why, then you have something like that that you can keep on hand for those moments when you know yeah. that. It's like, oh man, I'm going to be going through it this next week because I got to be doing whatever, you know, late nights or whatever yep. got going on, right? Then you could utilize something like that. Well, I'll be the one lagging behind you guys. So we'll see uh, if you guys grow a tail or anything. And if you don't, then maybe I'll, <laughs> Doug and I will try it. Call us out, dude, yeah. if I got scales or my eyes start twitching or something. Are Justin, you, Justin and I will be on here. Just are break, you are you on any right now, Doug? Do they have you on anything right now? Not yet. No. 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 You're the El Natural guy. He's the there. healthiest one. Yeah. I know. They just, look at Doug's stuff and they're like, "There ain't shit we could do with you, but you. you got everything." <laughs> I, Doug, I tell you what, I, I ran into someone who I hadn't seen since Orange Theory a while back, <clears throat> and she was talking about she. Uh, I didn't know she had been following the show. Like I met her when we first got into Orange Theory. She was a trainer. And uh, was talking about uh, all of us and, and and made a comment about you and I. About how, how much older we look? Yeah, how much older we look. <laughs> I'm like, I know when I look back at some of these photos. I mean, Distinguished yeah. is what she meant. Yeah. yeah. Now, D Doug slowly sucks. The, he slicks a youth out of you. Yeah, I know. You know. He's a, what do, they, what do you call that? Energy vampire, maybe? Yes, I don't know. yes. No. I'm joking. I think but that would make sense. Yeah. Doug, no, I'm just, I'm just taking so lean from the air. Justin, yeah. got, Justin got more buff and more handsome. Doug looks younger, and you and I, so I think we they literally sucked it all out of us. Damn, yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, yeah, they're in the back, quiet. Hey, those guys that talk a lot, don't worry. We'll <laughs> yeah, 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 we'll, we'll get we'll get them while in. they're talking. We'll be taking some, yeah, yeah, we'll get them in a li little bit, <laughs> exactly. Doug, <laughs> hey, I, do. uh, today for the shout out, I wanted to shout out somebody who I've shouted out before. Um, but the reason why I'm going to bring him up again since we're like formally doing this every episode now. Uh, I, I've got a couple of DMs where people, and by the way, I appreciate when people share people like this, like they're like, Oh, check this coach out or check this person out. Um, and cause sometimes I've found some really neat people that way. And somebody had shared this, uh, coach, uh, and guy was actually presenting pretty good information. Um, but, uh, I still have yet to find anybody who I think is putting out better sports performance content than Paul Fabritz. I think that, I mean, I've been tracking him for seven years plus now and not only has he put good content out but i mean the, his whole ecosystem like he's got all kinds yep. of great programs and stuff like that and he communicates him. it very very well yes and that's what i love like so it's funny you say that because you didn't know what i was going to talk very about much. but this guy i liked this guy his, his content was really good but he also um, he, you know 
and I don't know what this is, why people love, people love like when you use like technical terms and you get all wordy with stuff to yeah. sound like, like you had this, you have this breakthrough bit of information yeah. about something. And it's just like, you know, you all, textbook. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, you know, all he's really saying is this, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like in a really complex way to sound really, really smart. But one of the things I love about Paul Fabritz uh, and his handle is PJF performance is that he has that level of knowledge uh, because you can go extremely deep. He's very intelligent, but then he does a great way. He does a great, great job of uh, communicating that to the average person that is just looking for the, the average teenage guy or boy that's like, I just want to add four inches to my vertical, you know, or I want to, yeah. I want to get this much faster or whatever like that. Like he communicates that so well. And so if you are in the sports performance world. He specializes in basketball, but a, a lot of the stuff that he does for basketball is transferable in almost any other sport. Uh, so if you haven't followed Paul, you got to follow Paul. I love his content. Hey, check it out. Go to this company called Sleep Me. In fact, the link is sleep.me forward slash pump 30. This company makes products that dramatically improve your sleep. So like one of their devices, you put this pad on your mattress under your sheets, and you control it with an app, and it cools or warms your bed. It monitors the temperature, maintains the temperature. It could slowly warm up to, to wake you up in the morning, cool down at night to maximize things like growth hormone and melatonin production. It helps you fall asleep faster, stay asleep. It makes a tremendous difference in your sleep quality. Go check this company out. Again, it's sleep.me forward slash pump 30, and that'll offer you a discount on their products. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from and zero NBR. What is the benefit of cable movements when compared to their dumbbell counterparts? Oh boy. Cables versus dumbbells. Cables are my favorite machine form of exercise because they're more like free weights than I would say like machines because they allow freedom of movement. You're not limited to a track like you might be on a, on a plate loaded machine or a selectorized piece of equipment. Um, and, uh, they're super, super versatile. What's the benefit of cables? Constant, I'm not constant tension. I would say, yeah, that's the big one. And I'm not, um, restricted by gravity. So with dumbbells, I'm just working against gravity. So I can't take a dumbbell and create resistance going down like I would with like a cable crossover. So cables allow me a lot of versatility and the constant tension. There's no, there's no like weight curve. Like what I mean by that is if I do a curl with the dumbbell, the heaviest point of the curl is going to be at the midpoint when I'm fighting gravity directly. When I'm up here at the top or at the bottom, it's actually not truly, the stress isn't the same because I'm not fighting gravity directly. Whereas with cables, if it's 30 pounds, it's 30 pounds all the way through. Now this doesn't mean cables are better. It just means that they're a lot different than dumbbells, a lot more different. So when you put them together, you've got great variety. I'm glad you said it like that because I think this is coming up uh, this person probably follows, um, I forget his name. His handle is like the hypertrophy coach or something. He just did like a whole video on the whole, you know, cable versus free weight type of oh. argument. And, you know, the, the truth, and I, and I don't like feeling like we're being forced into one camp or the other. Yeah. I think you heard the message around free weights from us so much because we think that so many people neglected uh, free weights, right. right? Like if they fell out of favor, yeah, they fell out of favor, right? Obviously early, you know, in the, you know, seventies, eighties and nineties, they were more popular. I'd say nineties was when the cables really started cables and machines started to really take over in the nineties, two thousands and so forth. So I think that the, the reason why you probably hear us advocating for free weight and barbell exercises mm. so much is because we think that people neglect that more. Now, in a perfect world, you have both. I mean, both are uh, amazing. And I just think that that the only reason why you hear more about the free weight argument is the point that I'm making. But, you know, take an exercise like uh, a rear fly, like so a bent over rear delt fly, an incredible exercise for building your delts. I love that and prefer that on a on a cable machine because when you come down, right, and you're at the, at the bottom with the dumbbells, there's like no, no tension. Resistance. There's no resistance, no tension on the delt at all. Whereas when I'm on that cable and I'm pulled and it's stretched, I'm in that stretch position and some of the highest tension is on it, which is completely opposite of what's going mm -hmm. on with cables. I mean, excuse yeah. me, with free weights. And so the the benefits of that when if if all I ever did was dumbbell rear flies I wouldn't get any of that because I, mm -hmm. I have no tension there whatsoever so um, yeah I don't don't neglect either one and I guess 
the, the, the real benefit of each of them individually comes from which one do you tend to do more of? If you find yourself using machines and cable at the time, you are missing out on all the great benefits yeah. of free weights. If all you ever do is free weights and you're like, oh, I'm an anti-machine cable guy, well, then you're missing out on a lot of benefits from cables. Put both in your program. Totally. I love cables for just increasing overall volume for specific body parts or, you know, following up on uh, areas that I'm really trying to build and develop more exclusively. Um, but yeah, I, in terms of that versus something else, like it's it's in combination. Um, there's so many benefits from dumbbells and from barbells and um, in, in terms of overall uh, muscle stimulus and growth to avoid that would be a mistake. Uh, I mean, I, I do think that this provides a lot of value uh, to, to complement and pair with that, but I, but exclusively, I think you're pretty limited. Yeah. And, and I want to add one thing because what we try to do, we, we're limited with our knowledge of different types of resistance and how they affect the body. Like it, it can be hard to explain why a free weight squat, uh, let's say would build more muscle effectively in the lower body than let's say a hack squat, for example. And, uh, we could talk about tension on the muscle and leverage and, but at the end of the day, there's still some mystery. Like why is it that free weights tend to, I mean, I, I think it's dumb to pick one or the other. I think it's smart to utilize all of them. Okay. But if you absolutely have to pick one, um, I think free weights edge machines out and, and I, and the best argument I could use, which isn't a great argument still is that our bodies evolved lifting resistance, uh, or working against resistance that more is more like free weights than it is like machines or cables. So lifting a boulder or a, a log or swinging something or throwing something, Gravity has, for most of human history, operated in one way, and we didn't have bands, cables, and machines, and so our bodies evolved in a particular way. That's the best argument I have. I know it's not a good one, but yeah. I definitely think that the reason why we tend to promote free weights so much, besides the fact that people neglect them, is that they just tend to be generally more effective when you look at the whole picture. And again, not a great argument. Um, I'm sure we'll figure more things out later on. But that's kind of where I stand with it. But I think you're dumb if you go, well, I'm only going to pick this. Or yeah, pick get that. out of the camp. There's no reason to be uh -huh. in a camp here. I do want to head off, though, something that will probably come back to us whenever we ask someone. But, oh, but why? if you guys advocate for both, then why does this program not have any of it in there? We have multiple programs. I know. There. And so that's because <laughs> this always happens when we talk about a benefit that's of something. That's the right job. I mean, always, it always happens. We talk about the benefits and then someone's like, well, then why doesn't your program have that? Well, uh, it's because all of our, one program isn't designed to run that those one. Those are all pieces of the puzzle. Yeah, that's right. So it's like, you should run that for a while and then move into another program that does have them. <laughs> Next question uh, is from Olivia 11 Welch. Can or should women take the week off lifting during their period? And if so, what should they be doing in place of lifting? So here's why I don't like, first off, can you? Yeah, you can take a week off whenever you want. Should you? I, that's a, I, I don't think that's a good question because when you look at all of the things that can affect or influence whether or not you should take a week off, your period is way down the list. What's, what's higher than that? Well, your sleep, your daily stress, your nutrition, your nutrition. Are you overtrained? Are you undertrained? You have joint pain, whatever. So you could be on your period and everything feels great. So then what should you take the week off because you, you feel great? Like just cause you're on your period, that doesn't make any sense. Right. Or you could be during the week when you're supposedly your strongest, which may be ovulation, but you're overtrained, you're tired, you got poor sleep. Well then take it off. At the end of the day, it's really about how you're feeling in the moment not about when your period is coming or what 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 time you're in the cycle because you may be stronger during that period of time when you're on your period, not because you're on your period, but rather because of all the other factors I talked about. We've answered this question a couple of times before. It's been, a, it's been a while, but I have recently seen more marketing material around yep. around this, is just, which is why I'm assuming that this question has come back up because it's again. an easy sell. It is right. Oh. It's a, it, and so and really Train with your natural cycle, and that's right? so really that's what you're seeing is someone saying that. And the and the truth is, there's such an individual variance, uh, not just from you know person to person genetically, but also all the factors that Sal said 
that it really depends on on the person and programming specifically. So there might be somebody who or, you know bought some program where they someone does this. Well, they and it's like oh my god, that that was the missing key for me. It might have been. I mean, maybe maybe that you are the person who when that during that or time, maybe you just need a week off. Yeah, or or that right. You know, <laughs> but the, the, I you know uh, I've had enough clients and and dated enough girls that have have been had both sides of this right that are like i've actually had girls that during this time actually felt great and love yeah. to train hard during the during, during that week uh and then i've had others that are like they don't want to do anything they can't move they feel miserable like so it just really depends so you know what's funny about this i, I like to flip this on women right so because you'll have female influencers or whatever selling programs around this right, right. but i like to flip this on them and i like to say so when your boyfriend says that during this time of the month, you're really irritable and he shouldn't be around <laughs> you, does, is there truth to that? No, it's because he's an asshole because this happened. Right, of course, because there's other factors that can influence how you feel, not just your hormones. And if you add up all those other factors, they can actually very strongly outweigh what's happening with your cycle. That doesn't mean don't consider it. That just mm. means creating a program based on your cycle that doesn't take in, that, that makes you maybe ignore all these other signs and signals, it's not smart. It's not smart. By the way, at one point, I thought about writing a program like this. And the reason why I didn't was exactly that. I thought, well, this doesn't make any sense because somebody could have poor sleep or diet or stress or whatever. And I'm going to be telling them to work out harder just because they're ovulating or work out lighter just because what if that's not right for them at that moment? Yeah, I'm not teaching people how to train themselves properly. I actually teach them how to ignore themselves is what I'm trying. Of all the factors, it's not the, it's not even the top three of no. what that should make the difference on whether you take the week off or not. That's right. Well, that's the beauty too. Resistance training is moldable. So you can titrate your intensity, your volume and all that. So it's more of a recovery. If this is something that's sort of debilitating for you, or if it's not really affecting you that much, you know, it, it, it should be just fine. Next question is from Parlor Life. Is intermittent fasting the same as calorie restriction? Yeah, I like this question. Physiologically, the benefits that we see from intermittent fasting seem to mimic almost exactly the benefits you get from cutting your calories. In other words, the you know, the, the improvement and things like blood lipids and the, the way mm. that it, you know, affects cell autophagy, all these like, you know, buzzwords that they use, you know, mitochondrial health, all that stuff. Isn't that what Dr. Walter Longo kind of showed in his studies with his uh, low protein diet? Yeah. yeah. His fasting mimicking diet. Yeah. yeah. So, so 500, yeah, five, yeah. 500 calorie a day. Yeah. So physiologically it's, it's, I think it's so far the data shows that's pretty much the same thing. If you cut calories or you're in a fast, you'll get the same physiological effects. What now, about the psychological There you go. That's where the difference is. From restricting from that. That's the difference. Becoming present and actually you know, learning what hunger really feels like versus cravings. Like, Which is, by the way, if you've been listening to this show long enough, I think that's been the consistent messaging that we've, how we've presented intermittent fasting for years now. I mean, we wrote a guide on it, I don't know how many years ago, and we don't recommend it to the average person. We don't recommend it for fat loss. We recommend it for the 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 relationship with food. Many people uh, have no idea what real hunger feels like. They think they do, but mm -hmm. it's normally cravings. And a lot of the things that we do is out of cravings or out of habits and just react reactions. Like so, I I love teaching someone fasting for for those reasons. Not ever. In fact, if someone ever comes to me and goes, "Hey, I want to do intermittent fasting because I want to shed ten pounds," I normally right away say, "Don't." Yeah, dumb 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 way to use fasting. You know, it's the it's probably the oldest and most worldwide, I'd say, you know, consistent dietary modification uh, that we have in history is fasting. And it's it was never used as a way to lose weight. Of course, weight loss diets didn't exist until much later, but it was it's almost always been used as a spiritual practice, as a way of detaching from earthly things, uh, of becoming present. So like you don't eat food for a while. Now, of course, this could go in a dysfunctional direction. So if you have any type of eating disorder, this, I'm not talking to you, but for the average person who, who doesn't go, you know, three, four hours without food or never has gone 24 hours without food, except for maybe when they were really sick, not eating anything for a day or two days or three days, there's definitely a component, a spiritual component. There's definitely a component in where you start to realize like, Oh, I like to reach for food to numb myself when I'm stressed or when I'm sad or 
this is really weird. Uh, it's lunchtime. I'm not supposed to, you know, I'm not eating today. I'm finding myself, am I really hungry or is this just a craving? And then when hunger actually kicks in, wow, this is so different. I'll almost eat, I'll eat almost anything. Whereas before I had preferences. So from a, from a, that psychological, spiritual side, fasting can have tremendous benefits when it comes to like weight loss. Uh, the physiological effects, when you take that other part out, it's no different than just cutting your calories. Next question is from Jada Rankin. Could you explain more about the central nervous system and how it influences performance and recovery? Oh, I love that somebody asked this question. You know, of all the things that I think that we've shared with each other um, during this journey that we've been in for almost eight plus years now, um, one of my favorite things that you have ever said, Sal, was the the speaker amplifier analogy. Yeah, I have to admit, up until that point, I don't think I ever communicated central nervous system to my clients very well until that. And I, it just I felt like a light bulb went off for me. Like, what a great way to explain its role because it is extremely complicated, but unbelievably important to your your recovery and performance and and muscle building. Yeah, it's it, muscles are dumb, right? If you take your bicep off your body, it just sits there. It doesn't do anything. The central mm -hmm. nervous system is is what tells it what to do. And so the analogy is like uh that, that I used is that your muscles are speakers and your central nervous system is the amplifier. And and you could have like very high performance speakers, very big powerful speakers. But if your amplifier is non-existent or sucks or weak, you're not going to get any performance out of the speakers. Or very minimal. Or very minimal. Or you could have subpar speakers, but a phenomenal amplifier and get incredible uh, performance. So and by the way, give give the analogy of, of what that person kind of looks like, right? We've dealt with that, with that, right? Oh, yeah. Like, like you, you'll you see Olympic lifters are great examples of this, right? They compete in weight classes. They can lift tremendous amounts of weight for the, the, the their size. And what they've done is they've become masters of CNS, of their central nervous system. They know how to just squeeze out every bit of juice and energy and fire it in such a unified, mm -hmm. efficient way that this 170-pound athlete can lift weights that a 270-pound bodybuilder can't even yeah. touch. So well, it's, go ahead. It's been practiced so many times uh, that it's basically been buried in the subconscious where this is like a hardwired system now that that now it, it allows like these governings that are usually in place to kind of lower the amount of force you're able to produce it allows a lot more force to come through uh and this is an advantage that uh, olympic lifters have because of that discipline dedication to all the nuance and the detail of being able to uh, repeat this process uh perfectly totally on a simple level right the cns tells the muscle how hard to contract on a more complex level, the CNS is what organizes the technique and the skill. So if you look at like um, throwing a baseball, okay, you take a bodybuilder who's obviously got m far bigger, more powerful muscles than a, a high school baseball player, but the baseball player's central nervous system organizes its their body in a way to maximize technique, and so the ball goes further. But then again, if you go down to the simple level and you just look at just the bicep, right? The CNS can make the muscle relax. By the way, this is what makes you flexible or not flexible. People think a muscle that's flexible is more pliable, like, like it's like it's rubber that you warm up or something like that. It doesn't work that way. It's literally the central nervous system allowing the muscle to stretch or to contract. So it's like the governor it controls everything. And when you train your muscles, you, in, you train your CNS. You, you train them both all the time. And if you disregard the CNS, then you're going to not be able to reap uh, all the maximum benefits that you're looking for from your training because you can actually fry your CNS. But here's here's a good example: lose two nights of sleep, go work out. You're way weaker. What happened? Are your muscles smaller? No, your CNS yeah. is fried. On the flip side, you could give someone an injection of adrenaline and they'll go lift 10, 15 percent more weight. What happened? Their muscles get bigger? No, there's their the adrenaline made their their CNS fire. I love. I love talking about this because um, I always used to be mystified as to how some of these smaller guys were able to pull off these superhuman feats of strength uh, while these big muscular guys, you know, couldn't perform the same thing. And uh, a lot of times too, like it is adrenaline, uh, you know, as part of that, but really it's like 
it's that whole process of, of your body just allowing all that force to be generated when normally you're pretty much stifled from being able to do that because all the governing is in place keeping you safe. Yeah. It, it's the it's the communication system to your muscles from your brain to your muscles, and just imagine all things that would improve if your communication system from your brain to your muscles is improved. Totally. Recovery is better. Performance is better. Strength is better. It's all better because you have a better communication. If you have a poor communication to all these muscles, you're going to have all those things are a little less. That's how impactful having a strong central nervous system is. And so I love this conversation too. I think it's something that is one of the most overlooked things when like programming and thinking about the intensity applied in a training routine. Like I really think it's an area that even a lot of trainers neglect because again, it took me even years to understand it. Then I had, I never had brought the words to be able to communicate it really well to clients. And until I remember us all hanging out and like Sal using that analogy, I'm like, what a great way to explain that to the uh, average person who's trying to understand what the hell is this thing. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I've read articles on this and they, they in some in a lot of these articles, they think that the average person can exert uh, at any given moment up to like 50 or 60% of their actual potential strength. And that's yeah. because their CNS doesn't allow them to exert any more strength because it doesn't feel safe or unstable because it's got these kind of like, it's like a speed limiter on your car. Olympic, your muscle right up the bone sometimes. Yeah, well, Olympic athletes, on the other hand, eighty or ninety, right? Yeah, they can exert eighty to ninety yeah, percent of crazy. their of their total potential, and the ones that go above ninety are obviously world champions. It's also why you hear the story of like the mom who lifted the car, the burning car off her kid, you know, and you're like, how did she do that? By the way, these stories are true. Sometimes where you see these crazy feats of strength, well, under extreme duress, the CNS. Uh, is like, okay, we're going to injure ourselves because this is obviously worth it for whatever reason. And so, boom, the juice hits. And they injure themselves, but they move the car or they actually are able to lift something real oh, heavy. I mean, it's one of the simplest ways to explain the 185-pound Olympic lifter who is stronger than Phil Heath. Yeah. I mean, there's examples of these, these high-level Olympic athletes that can – you know, squat more weight than someone like Phil Heath. And you're looking at it. It's a very obvious how strong one of those guys look, but the other one may not look as strong, but it is stronger because of this. I mean, that's the, that is the, the, the simplest explanation for the, the difference between those two. It is. And this is why you feel stronger when you're angry or, you know, when you're excited or, you know, that's why people, you know, power lifters slap themselves in the face and, Sniff yeah. smelling salts. It's all to get the yeah. CNS. <laughs> yeah, totally. Let's get the CNS kind of fired up. So I love it. It's a, it's a great conversation. I think you need to consider both when you train your body. You don't want a bunch of dumb speakers, uh, but of course you want to look good and you need to have the speakers as well. So train everything. Personally, I like, uh, I like, I, I've always wanted to be stronger than I looked. That's just because something that's what I, I, I appreciate. And so this conversation for me, if you ever want to read up on, on this kind of stuff, you just look at some of the, the Soviet era weightlifting studies because they were like masters of figuring this out. That's why they dominated weightlifting for, for decades. I feel like there's a, a pickup line in there like, hey, girl, got beautiful looking speakers, but do they sound good? <laughs> wow. And with, and with that, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So you can find Justin on, uh, on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin, Adam and on, on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. You can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 